<laughs> okay, we got four, three laughs, one smile, and lots of groans. <laughs> Inside, so that's one good thing about the having some people around you. You can hear if somebody laughs. At a previous meeting that was all virtual, someone did chat, ha ha, to one of my jokes. <laughs> I didn't know if they were serious or not. <laughs> See, my, my throwback this month is uh, I'm wearing it and in Tranco shirts. Oh, yeah. See that? And uh, for those who don't remember, in Tranco was established in 1962, and they did a, a, a lot of work for ADOT back in back in the day. In fact, there's still several people around in other, in other firms now that, that work for uh, in Tranco. And Tranco was assimilated by DMJM, which is now AECOM. Steve O'Brien is familiar with DMJM and in 2005. So uh, uh, it, it is always Things are always longer ago than they seem. <laughs> that shirt used to be white. <laughs> oh man, that is. This is like the second time I've worn it. Ted Andrews has a story about the first time I wore it, but uh, <laughs> I don't know if he's on, on or not. Um, is someone from FHWA here? Nobody from FHWA. I was hoping, well, maybe a, a spokesman for ADOT will be able to answer a couple of questions. Anything for, are you the only ADOT rep that will speak for ADOT as far as Steve? Well, I'm sure if, if um, Dallas or Steve or Greg Byers or any of them are joined virtually, they could answer some questions, but I don't know if they were joining. So I might be the only person that can Just try it. I believe Steve is the only person. Yes, Steve is the only person. Okay. Okay, so I'm on. Okay. <laughs> well, before I introduce you and your topic, can you sure. tell us what's going on in ADOT? Sure. Um, can can talk a little bit about it. So um, this, most of you probably know with uh, the approval of the governor's budget, there was $320 million uh, that was allocated towards um, various projects uh, to move forward. Um, of special interest is 90 million of that was allocated for what we're calling life extension projects. So trying to get our pavements from, you know, a fair condition to a good condition. So we're in the process of preparing a solicitation to get consultants to help us with that. There are actually 17 separate projects that constitutes that 90 million. These projects are gonna be performed very similar to the CARES Act projects, meaning that they're going to be five to 10 sheets. There's not gonna be any additional things added to the projects. Um, these are, will get done quickly and get out. Um, hopefully there's, you know, there shouldn't be any ground disturbing issues most of these will be like the removal and replacement of a friction course or it could be a thin bonded overlay but very very simple projects and uh, we've assigned jeff davison from our office who's going to be the project manager on that so he's working on putting the solicitation together getting the project you know uh, federal numbers so that we can hopefully have that advertised sometime in uh, early q2 um, there's a couple other projects that um, are associated with the governor's budget. One is an overpass at Riggs Road on 347. Um, there was separate money allocated or proposed for a study and then design and then a separate for construction. Um, MAG is conducting a study right now. Uh, on what that overpass or what the feasibility of the overpass would be and 
kind of the configuration. Um, once they have got their study to a draft final stage, then we will move forward with putting out a solicitation for a DCR at that location. Um, our PM is Barat Kendall. Um, we're anticipating mid um, Q2, but that's really dependent on how MAG uh, finishes up their study and gets concurrence from all their stakeholders to move forward. Um, <clears throat> Those are two new projects that weren't listed prior, you know, in our five-year plan. There are some other standalone projects there that we're still trying to investigate. Um, you've got to realize a lot of those projects, or the funding for those projects was not based on information from ADOT. It was based on information from, from other sources. And so we're trying to determine, do we need to do a study phase first? Um, are these going to just be pavement pres projects? Those kind of things. But, We've assigned PMs to all of them, and you should be looking in the next you know, Q2, Q3, we'll be putting out some solicitation on those as well. So that's covers kind of the governor's budget. Um, been asked in the past, you know, what are we doing, getting ready for, um, you know, if the highway bill uh, passes and we move forward. Um, I'm sure there's some folks at ADOT that are looking at, you know, how they want to prioritize those projects and move forward. Unfortunately, I've not been part of that, so I can't really speak to how that funding would be used if and when it's actually approved. Um, I know that, you know, ADOT in general, if you look at our five-year plan, we're really looking to, to move forward on rehabilitating and preserving our existing uh, system. Um, you know, we've had our system degrade over the past few years and more pavements are in fair condition than in good. And we want to reverse that trend. So I'm sure that if uh, left up to uh, the management at ADOT, that those projects, uh, the funding would go towards getting more of those types of projects out on the street. But obviously, you know, I'm sure that there's conversations happening with uh, State Transportation Board. Uh, I just can't say if, if there will be expansion projects out of that or not. So it is. As we get closer, I guess, as it comes through, you know, if I can find out, I'll try and disseminate that information in a future way. But right now, I haven't been part of those conversations. Okay. Thank you. They have a question that if, if HW was on the line, I would ask them, but it was related to ADOT. So I'll ask you, and okay. it might be from those guys across the street, Mike, but we had this okay. Last week, HWA brief. Uh, state highway agencies on the uh, the uh, funding shortfall of the highway trust fund. Do you have any oh. idea what that briefing was? Sorry, no, it wasn't okay. part of that. Okay, no problem. Sorry. Uh, you know, I forgot to you know have everybody.
Yeah, a couple. We took a vote here, and I'm not allowed to tell any more jokes today. Or forever. Thank you for that. Yeah. I think uh, we might have got cut up. I said, you know, that's, we don't go one by one and introduce ourselves. Everybody turn your camera on just for a few seconds so we can see you smile and wave. And your hair doesn't have to be fixed. So don't worry about that. I'm personally not worried about my hair being fixed, Steve. As an FYI. All right. Well, again, our guest speaker today is Steve O'Brien, and uh, he got his both a bachelor's and a master's degree at Purdue. Were you born in Indiana? I was born in Detroit, but oh, sorry. my family moved around a lot. Okay. Pardon? The year? Year? Uh, <laughs> my master's was 85, my undergrad was 82. So you're still pretty young. I mean, you're right up there with me. <laughs> <laughs> He's <laughs> got a total of 36 years of, uh, of engineering experience. 33 have been with in the private sector. I mentioned BMJM earlier. He was, uh, that's when I met Steve, was back in the late 80s, maybe. And you were at BMJM as a management consultant for the early part of the Phoenix Freeway system. Last three and a half years have been with ADOT. He's been the manager of the project management group. That's technically the senior division administrator. And uh, you know, during his career, he's traveled a lot, but he's been based in Arizona that whole time. He's married, has three grown children, daughters, all girls. He says he's happy to say they live close by, but no longer in his house. His hobbies include cars, Camaros, Concerts, college football and basketball, and building Halloween props. The Halloween props, that's why his daughters probably don't live with him anymore. <laughs> I've seen pictures of his front yard during Halloween, but it's quite impressive. Uh, Steve will present uh, the new aesthetic guidelines, so I'll turn it over to you, Steve. Thank you for All right. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. So this is a little unusual kind of topic, I think, for this group, but this is something that we just completed um, at the uh, end of our last fiscal year, and these became effective on July 1st. So can I get the next? Please. Everything is connected. There we go. So I guess maybe people are asking, what's the reason? Why did we why did we go through a process to update these? Well, uh, on some recent projects, we've uh, we've run into a, a little bit of some issues that we had to address, and a group of us felt it was time to maybe provide some guidance to project managers, to stakeholders, to um, district personnel, just what is considered a baseline aesthetic that ADOT typically would put, put in on a project versus um, what we would consider as an enhancement. Um, there were very inconsistent approaches to projects. It was almost like, depending on who was assigned to the project, um, made up what they felt the aesthetic should be on that job. And a lot of times it was, um, you know, things that I would consider are enhancements, others were considering were base, base model things that needed to be added to a project. Um, decisions were being made, not in a, not in a team environment. Uh, there were a lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings, one-off meetings that you know, ended up in making some obligations for ADOT that other uh, folks at ADOT um, couldn't really, um, live up to because we just don't have the resources. Um, and then we wanted to make sure that everyone was very clear, especially our stakeholders, that we can put enhancements on projects. That's not the issue. The issue is 
who pays for those enhancements and who maintains those enhancements. And because of that, um, a lot of times these conversations happen late in projects. And when that happens, um, it can delay projects if we can't come to an agreement on what's going to happen. So we said it was time to take another look at our, our guidelines, make them simpler, make them very explicit as to what our base conditions are, and then also look at our standard processes uh, in project development to see you know, where we needed to make some changes. So next slide, please. So there were three areas we focused on. One was kind of a change in our standard work in the development process, especially with how we communicate about aesthetics on projects, when and where and who's part of that. Um, we developed a new set of guidelines. I believe the old guidelines were close to 70, 80 pages. Um, these are now about less than 10. And then we have about 25 um, sheets that show examples that people can refer to of what the, the baseline aesthetics are. It's very clear we've laid out what um, <clears throat> what we do on an expansion project versus what we do for a new quarter. And then the other thing we did is we've developed a IGA template that addresses um, the aesthetic components on projects. And it clearly lays out, you know, whose responsibility for uh, maintenance on these features could be a fair enhancement and who, who pays for these features. So those were the three things that we actually developed as part of this new process. Next slide. Please. <clears throat> so on the communication protocols, as I said, a lot of times we don't start talking about aesthetics until late in the process. And whenever we start making changes or adding things late in the process that impacts our ability to deliver projects on time and on budget. So going forward, aesthetics is, it's mandatory to have aesthetics as part of the kickoff meeting agenda. These documents that we prepared will be provided to the stakeholders that are part of that project. So they have an understanding of what it is we will consider on a project, what we won't. They'll be given a copy of this IGA template. It won't be the final on the project, but at least it clearly spells out to everybody at the beginning of a job what our expectations are. Um, the uh, probably the the one that's most important is no more one-off meetings. Kind of mandate to my PMs that you know if there's a meeting to talk about aesthetics, especially with a stakeholder, it you will be there. The districts will be there. The districts can designate who they want. If it's someone from maintenance or someone from the development group, roadside development obviously will be there. Yeah, but this is going to be approached in a team setting. And we are going to document the decisions that are made at those meetings and distribute those out to everybody. Not, a lot of times what I was finding is decisions were made by a couple people, but somehow those never got documented and sent out to the whole project team, which caused problems. So it's fairly simple, but um, it's something that I needed to in introduce a standard work as part of our development process. Next slide. So the guidelines themselves, I've included a link, but really if you just go to ADOT's PMG site, there's a tab for aesthetic guidelines and it has a copy of, our, of the new guidelines as well as the IGA template that you can, can pull. Um, it addresses the baseline, I guess, hardscape features. I guess I, I should have started saying this. Um, one of the things we didn't do as part of this process or this update was to address planning and irrigation. Um, that would have taken uh, a little bit more time, would have needed to involve more people than we had uh, in coming up with these, these hardscape features. So that's something that will probably happen in the future. So again, these, these guidelines address the hardscape features on projects. Uh, it's broken down to new projects and then, like I say, um, enhancements projects or retrofit projects. If we're adding something to an existing facility, how we address those. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, it is set up such that we have a description at the beginning that talks about these features, but then we move to a table format so that it's very clear. Um, 
and I'll show you a copy of the guidelines if we can go through those tables real quick. Uh, and then, like I said, we included a number of illustrations for all of these features so that um, you can sit with a stakeholder of the team can and say, this is what we mean by this is the kind of rustification we would provide on a, on a wall or something like that. And most of them are actually photographs of what we've done around uh, the valley uh, in other areas um, so that it, it's clear. It's not just like a graphic. Next one. Next slide, please. This is kind of a breakdown. This is um, kind of the table of contents within the report itself, but uh, it just gives you the type of features that we're talking about. And we'll go through those when we pull up the guide. Um, next one, please. And then the same thing, this is just the link to the new IGA template that uh, we're going to start using on every project moving forward. Again, you can just go to the 8S8 uh, PMG site and uh, that template's there. Um, and basically it's just, it just addresses, you know, who pays for the enhancement and who's responsible for maintaining it. I guess the preface for folks that do this kind of work for us, consultants, is this doesn't mean that we won't consider enhancements on a project. That's not the intent. The intent was though, our resources are such now um, that we have a hard time with the ability to maintain a lot of the features that we have out there. And so this hopefully will, will clarify that. And if, if folks really want it, you know, we can, uh, we can plan for it. Uh, we just need a, a financial and a, and a resource commitment uh, to add them to a job at this point. Okay, I think that's the last slide. If you could pull up yep. the, the guide. And while she's doing it, just so you know, this we had um, two districts involved in this study. Uh, I think two people from PMG, and um, we had two people from uh, Roadside Development that um, helped put this together. Did you have any outside agency? I'm thinking MAG or? They weren't part of the actual study, but I have briefed MAG on this. MAG was glad to hear it because they, you know, there's been the cost issue that have come up on projects as we move forward because we haven't planned for it or, you know, it was, it was kind of interesting on the last two VE um, sessions that we held on a couple projects in the report out, aesthetics was actually part of what people were reporting out on. So that's why it's a pretty hot topic. A lot, some of these features get very expensive uh, to put in. Um, and we just weren't planning for it in the right, right manner. So these are the new guides. Uh, I give authorship really to roadside development on this. Um, John Hawk up put these together with help from his group. Um, if you could just pan down. Keep going. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time, you guys can pull this up yourself. It's not a long read by any means, but we talk about what aesthetic baseline um, features are. We try to make it very clear what we will consider that ADOT will add to a project and provide guidance to the teams as well as any consultants that are doing this kind of design for us, what we consider the baseline aesthetic. And then pan down just a little bit more. And then we went to a table format so that we talk about what the, the feature is and then what we consider is the baseline standard. And we have two tables in here, like I said, one for expansion projects. So an existing facility that we're modifying versus a new quarter, say like what we would propose on SR30 or segments of 303 or things like that that haven't been constructed yet. New interchanges that are added to the facility, those kind of things. As you can see too, we also list out, um, we show the illustrations that we think are appro appropriate to each of these features. And if you could just pan down, we can just take a look at, at some of the... So this is typical, you know, this typical restoration that ADOT would consider. And again, like I said, it's cross-linked back to the table so people have an understanding of what we're talking about. Um, we get down to paint color, how much, you know, how, how much, what 
type of paint color will we consider as part of the aesthetics? Uh, one of the things we find is um, some of the times there's a request that they want three or four or five different color accent colors for these features. Well, that's a lot of different colors for the district to have to maintain uh, for maintenance purposes. So we're kind of defined. We can do that, but uh, really you're going to get you know a base color and maybe two accent colors is our standard. Color. Is illustration five uh, an enhancement or a baseline? I think from from roadside development sites, since we have done this before and there are forms available, okay. it would be a you know it would be a base feature. I would agree. I mean, me personally, <laughs> I think some of these features that we put throughout you know the system, I would consider were probably originally an enhancement. So I know, like on the segment of the 101, you know, City of Scottsdale actually came to the plate with additional funding and. Those, you know, all the things you see out on the 101 are, are considered enhancements. This is going to be a living document, okay, because we just started implementing this in July. So one of the things I want to stress to people is, is teams start working with this document and implementing on projects. We may end up having to modify some of this to add something that maybe is more specific to Flagstaff or to Yuma or something like that. So. There can be changes. That's why I'm saying I can send you a copy of this document, but always go to the PMG web page because it will have the most current version of the document. You can also go to roadside development. We'll also have this on their web page as well. We're going through a, um, a series of kind of lunch and learns very similar to this um, with internal staff. Uh, yesterday, I presented this to the districts but they have a, a knowledge of, of the new guidelines. One of the things we are planning on doing is <laughs> assembling the group of consultants that do this type of work and sitting down and having a, uh, a presentation and a conversation about how to implement these. That'll probably happen a little later because I wanna make sure that John and roadside development can be, can be part of that conversation. If, if one of the nearby cities or somebody wants to add an enhancement, in that IGA format, do they just pay for maintenance or is there a way for them to maintain it themselves or that would be under permit to it? was, it'll be treated like a permit. I mean, if, it depends on the district you talk to. I mean, uh, if you talk to the central district right now, they just don't have the manpower to maintain all of the features that are out there. So this could be sometimes, you know, the IGA may say you actually will have to go in under permit and make any changes if there's any damage or vandalism or things like that. Um, that's the intent. The IGA also talks about um, when a facility, a local facility crosses our, our system, who has responsibility for minor maintenance of features um, on the cross street area that's in our right of way. So it usually deals with um, like litter pickup, minor damage like sidewalk buckling, things like that, um, uh, graffiti, those kind of things. So the IGA um, talks about both of those. Now, in some agencies, we have a master maintenance agreement, which covers all that, but really we don't have a master maintenance agreement with too many agencies, right? Now, so. so the IGA will be used for that as well. The whole intent is just bring it up early with these stakeholders so that they have an understanding that they're going to have to have some skin in the game as well. So you talk about maintenance. What does ADOS actually, I mean, what would be the maintenance? You could power wash it, graffiti removal, but you're not talking about re refreshing any paint? Would you repaint some of these things? The features themselves, the, the landform graphics, probably not. But if there's an event that for whatever reason that landform graphic is damaged, okay. So who has the responsibility for putting it back? Is it ADOT just because it's in our freeway? Is there an agreement in place that says, okay, ADOT will do it, but that local agency that wanted it to begin with understands they're going to have to provide some funding for that. That's the kind of things we're trying to do. So normal wear and tear fading over 20 years, yeah. it's going to be how it is. Correct. Anybody else? Yes, Steve. Historically, how much uh, graffiti or 
vandalism do you see on the enhanced parts of the freeway? And I'm thinking the concrete. Yeah. You know, I I don't know that I can stand here and say that. It's, that's probably a better question for the district to answer. Um, I know just driving around, I see, believe it or not, a lot of graffiti on our signs. Um, I don't know, like in those segments, the 101 through Scottsdale, has there been a, a rampant kind of graffiti issue that the districts had to deal with or not? I think uh, when I was paying attention to that, there's was very little graffiti over painted surfaces or or okay. the uh, the graphics that were embedded into the concrete. So. Okay. Well, that's a good question. I can I can go back to the district and ask them if they could pull some info for me, and I can share that with the group. You see it on some of the screen walls. They're called not noise walls up the top of the right away. They're easy to get to. Yeah, yeah. I think that's about the yeah. most prevalent that I've ever seen around. Again, these guidelines, just so everyone understands, are to be implemented statewide. Okay. Yes. On a, from a cost planning standpoint, is there any like percent of construction that's assumed for this for these enhancements, <clears throat> or is that been really thought about? We could calculate that based on that, but no. But I mean, to give you an example, a um, couple of projects that I started looking at at the DCR level. And then we started into design. The actual aesthetics that were being proposed as part of design, we're going to add three to five million dollars to the current construction estimate. And I just, you know, people don't realize that these things can cost quite a bit, you know, and can add up pretty quick. And of course, if we don't account for it in the DCR phase, then it means it's not programmed for, which then means uh, if we add them, I get to go back and to MAG and we get to go to regional council and ask for more money, which is always popular. So, um, actually what I've told folks is even when we start the DCRs, I'd like them to start having these conversations about aesthetics during the DCR, show them a copy of these guides, um, maybe not get into the, you know, the nitty gritty of all design, but just so that they're aware, you know, these are cost factors that if they want, they're going to have to, to start planning. And we started doing that on our on our DCRs that we're just starting out. So these guys are, you know, we started a number of new segments of freeway. And we're starting to design on a segment of the 303. We're using this. There's a segment of the 202 from Belvis to the 101. We're using this guideline. Uh, there's a segment of I-10 down south. Um, I have a roof off that we're using these guys as a means on that project. So we are starting to implement this on a lot of our projects that are out there now. So as you, you're in DCR, you come up with a theme, is it, is there roles and responsibilities determined on roadside developments involvement? I know as ADOT goes into the compliance reviews, there are a little bit different of a oversight group. So a designer comes up with a theme or is that through roadside development? Is that well, how who's the decision maker in that? Typically, roadside is involved in our, in our DCR. Okay, when it goes to design, if this project goes to a consultant, the consultant hires somebody to pull these together. That's the person sealing these drawings. I know there's probably been a lot of pressure about what ADOT would like to see, you know, with that person, and that's one of the things we talked about, but it. In the end, that's why I said no decisions are going to be made in a vacuum anymore. No more of these, someone's talking to the designer saying, make this change with that concurrence from the district and the project manager. If those conversations happen, when I told my PMs is, I don't care, it doesn't matter because we're not supposed to be doing that. So yes, I mean, um, I see this as, you know, a change over time. Uh, it's probably going to be an initial shock at the beginning on how we do this, but from my perspective, the, the consultant or the professional that's sealing those drawings, you know, should work with the team to come up with a thing, not work with one group in the AI. Thank you.
Any more questions? Really topic, I guess. Questions from our virtual audience. Uh, feel free to enter them in the chat or just turn on your camera and make sure you're off. And oh, do. there we uh, go. Steve, th this is Madhu. Uh, Steve, it's, you know, I, I should say this is long overdue. Thank you for getting this done. Um, I should blame Steve Jimenez for it because when I was at the district, we had to deal with it a lot and you know, all the changes. So a um, couple of you know, questions on this. So the accent color, um, I'm assuming it varies. Um, you know, is there a limit? Because I think most of you know, it's, it used to be one and then eventually got two. And then when we did three or three and other segments, it ended up becoming three or four. Um, is there going to be a limit on it? And then you know, some of the graphics uh, not necessarily fit during construction. And that's something we dealt with, with ro roadside. So how, how are those handled? Um, and, and um, you know, it's just making adjustments and all that. I know this guide is more of a general, you know, uh, overview, but, um, do, you know, on those changes, you know, does the district work with, um, with the, you know, project managers or how does it go? So with regards to the accent colors, the guides are very specific. The two accent colors are considered part of the baseline. If okay. more than that, that would be considered an enhancement. Okay. It doesn't mean that we don't have segments of, of our system that already have three or four accent colors um, and that the district might be maintaining them. But it, as we move forward, that would be the guide. So we don't want to be storing a bunch of different colors of paint, uh, you know. So we'll store two, and then there's actually a palette that's in the guidelines of the colors that are considered, you know, part of the baseline. So, um, so that hopefully answers that question. As far as it, it does, yeah. working with roadside, yes, that's the whole intent of of the new changes with how we're doing standard work through the development process. Um, we need to have everybody in the room to talk about all these issues because, like you say, it you know it looks great on paper, but we can't make it work in the field. Well, hopefully, by getting everybody in the room together throughout the design process, we'll be able to talk about those things early on, and then make smart decisions on how we would go about it. If we're going to add something that's a little bit different, how will that work? How will it fit on the law or wherever it's going? So that's the intent. Um, okay. That's why I say it's still going to be a work in progress, getting everybody, you know, kind of on the same page and, you know, understanding that uh, we are going to have to approach it from a team perspective and team means, you know, project management, roadside, district, as well as a stakeholder. So. No, that, that, that helps. And then last question um, on the planting. I know you mentioned you haven't, you know, that ha the discussion hasn't come up. But as, as you know, it starts widening the freeways, you know, and it, we've seen it in the past, in the last few years, um, the plant density pretty much stays the same. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think it's, it's nice. We have nice freeways and all that, but how, how are, you know, how is that going to be handled just to make sure there, you know, the landscaping is still accounted for? Um, is that, is that discussion happening or there will be additional uh, process that's going to be coming up? So what I've asked my project managers is to include that as part of these aesthetic talks, right? But I don't have a set of guidelines I can point to at this point, right? So this right now, it's going to rely back on, you know, uh, the professional that's providing those kind of uh, drawings, roadside development and, and their background and, and what needs to happen in these sections. Um, in the future, what we've talked about, the group that actually helped me put these together is that there would be a separate process where they would start looking at you know what kind of baseline landscaping features should we include um, one thing i can tell you that varies quite a bit from district to district depending on if districts even have any funding to be able to maintain landscaping uh, if you were to go down to tucson i think you would you'd see that, well, we want plans, but we don't want to have to have the irrigation because we can't you know, maintain it. You know, we don't want to pay for the water, who pays for the water, those kind of things. But we've got, you know, we've got some very, very temperature zones within the state as well. So putting together a statewide guide, I think, is going to take a little bit longer than it did for these hardscape. 
but I know that John Hooker from Roadside agreed that it, it, it's they need to put something together for the, the planning side of, of the aesthetics as well. I don't have a timing for it though at this point. Okay, no, thank you. That helps. I just know that I'm not going to head up that study. <laughs> Anybody else? There's no others on that. Oh. One last one then, Steve. Did, did this uh, guide address construction materials or methods? Not methods. So, precast versus cut, versus cast to place, foam, steel. Foam. No, I mean, the intent is we talked about okay, do we have standard forms available you know, that can be used? Yes. Uh, did we talk about means and methods? So now Steve, we didn't do that as part of this. So that's still open. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One too many Steve's in this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no, we didn't we didn't get into those elements of it. Uh, this was a fairly quick what we call PDCA. Um, we, we had this completed in three months. So a plan, do, check, act kind of process that we put in place. When we've got an issue, you know, what's the root cause? How do we address root causes? So this is the first one I've been on that was actually completed within three months. Well, there are some that have gone on much longer. <laughs> but again, this stemmed out of a problem that we had on a specific project where we had a, a winding of a freeway in what we call kind of a fringe area. The project started that we just do seating, ended up now it turned to more urban, and it ended up, you know, having landform graphics and a bunch of things on it that, you know, the district, you know, at the end of the project saying, wait a minute, we don't have the ability to maintain these things. So that's what kind of spurred this. This is happening more and more. Um, our IGA, um, we had some good IGAs in the past, but they didn't really address what happens if we have to come back in and modify a segment of roadway and who's responsible, you know, for those costs if we if we have to to fix some of the features or have to move them and those kinds of things. So that was really the intent. And plus, you gotta remember my PMs are not landscape architects. No, no, no. I'm not. So what is a baseline feature? I needed to give them some kind of guide that they could follow. So they could have some intelligent conversations with stakeholders. As All right. Thanks, Steve. Okay. Thank you, Justin. Any? Announcements from you, Justin. <laughs> Am I good? All right. It's the first time I've done this too. So <laughs> thanks. Thank you all for bearing with us during the technical portion of our presentation today. Um, of course, uh, if there's anything that can go wrong with it, it will go wrong. Uh, but thanks for hanging in there. We really appreciate that. Just a couple quick announcements from ACEC. Please don't forget about roads and streets next month. October 6th through 8th at the Elton Keys Door in Tucson. We still have plenty of registrations available. However, rooms are going fast. So if you are interested in being within our rooming block, uh, we have some lovely hotels, uh, please go ahead and register as soon as possible to make sure that you have a bed. Uh, also with regard to roads and streets, on the morning of October 6th, we are having our Par Wars golf tournament. So you definitely don't want to miss that. We still have some foursomes available and of course some sponsorships. And I can't guarantee what Amerigo and I will be wearing, but uh, I'm sure you'll get a kick out of it nonetheless. Uh, we have a lot of costume changes planned. Um, so anywho, if you want a good laugh anyway, uh, that might be reason enough to come. Also, uh, we are currently in the judging process for Engineering Excellence Awards. So just keep in mind that the ceremony um, or the gala, as we like to call it, will be Saturday, October 16th. All are welcome, of course. And we were holding this uh, gala at the Desert Botanical Garden. So fancy, fancy. Um, so 
Anyway, thank you all so much for being here. I very much appreciate, once again, your patience. Uh, we'll get it absolutely right next time. And Steve, I'll let you close us out. Steve J, I think. All right. <laughs> close us out. Thanks for coming. See you in October. <laughs> no, we will have October 1st. Wednesday, probably. Well, now I leave it. that to the experts over here. Okay, well, so we can either move it to later in the month or we'll. Let's skip October. We're skipping October, everybody. <laughs> okay, so because we plan on seeing you at Rose and Street. <laughs> so, anywho, so that means we'll be seeing you right back here in November. And um, Steve, you've got some time off to come up some good dad jokes. So, <laughs> don't forget. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you again for being here. Oh, Mr. Pay. Uh, I noticed on the uh, announcement for the Maricopa County Day Zone, mm -hmm. there wasn't didn't seem to be a hybrid. Is it just virtual? And it's just virtual. Uh, Maricopa Only? County Liaison will just be virtual because Amerigo and I need to go down to Tucson oh. and meet with the properties for Roads and Streets. So it's the only time that we could do it. So that one will be a virtual only meeting. However, everything else that we have planned, we will be doing hybrid. So you're welcome to come here or join us online. Here is good. 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 All right. Thank you guys so much for being here, and we will see you in November. Bye, everybody. Early. Nope, no, 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 no,